Mario, from your work in, uh, in physics and in cosmology, you've really had a very broad experience in terms of working with different questions from the solar system to, to, to cosmology. Uh, from that perspective, what, what, what's your view about life in the cosmos in general? And we have two categories. One is any kind of life, maybe three categories. One is any kind of life that we don't even, can't even imagine. A Second category is just any kind of simple carbon-based life or something that was similar, that's similar to us. And the third category is sentient life that has awareness uh, similar to what we have. Uh, what, what have we learned and what do you infer from that? So maybe the first thing that we have learned and which is extremely important is that we discovered that even if you look just at the Milky Way galaxy, and I'm not speaking now, you know, about the universe at large, but even just our Milky Way galaxy. There are billions and billions of planets that are roughly like Earth, maybe not exactly like Earth, which are orbiting their star in that Goldilocks zone, which we call the habitable zone, namely that zone which is not too hot, not too cold, so that it allows for liquid water, liquid water to be on the surface of a planet. So that is very, very important. And that's a fantastic discovery because just, just a few years ago, people had thought that that might be a rare occurrence. Well, we had no idea, in fact. Until 1995, yeah, yeah. we have not known of a single planet orbiting a uh -huh. normal star yeah, outside the solar system. Amazing. Yes, in 92, we discovered planets around the pulsar, but there is no life there yeah. for sure. But, you know, around the normal star, only 1995. So, you know, it's just a little over two decades yeah. ago. So, so this is an incredible discovery. Not only that, we have now advanced to the point where within two to three decades, I believe, we will be able to characterize the atmospheres of some of these planets. Through transits. Uh, the for example, through transits, when you know they go in front of their star. And the, the starlight goes through the atmosphere, have ever small, and you can get a spectrograph. That's right. So you can get a spectrum. You can find which, what is the composition of that mm. atmosphere. But also to image those planets. Mm. And the combination of all these techniques will tell us within about two to three decades, I believe, whether we can find biosignatures, some signs of life. What are signs of life? Signs of life, for example, we know that in the Earth's atmosphere, uh, we have this disequilibrium where you can find oxygen on one hand and methane on the other. So this was done by life. So if we can find that, we find some signs of life. Now this is most likely primitive life, but still it's life. So, so that's a very, very important thing. At the same time, we're also advancing on the search for intelligent or complex life through radio observations, you know, to see if we can get some signals that, you know, we cannot be explained by natural phenomena. So my, it's hard to make predictions in this area, but my guess is that if within, let's say, three decades, we don't find any biosignatures or any signal, mm. we will at least be able to place some meaningful constraints and say, oh, you know, under these circumstances, life happens only in less than 10% of yeah. all right. planets. And as time goes on, those constraints would get tighter and even, tighter even or better. discovery. That's right. Yeah. One of the things I found interesting is that, um, that some of the uh, the, the habitable the, uh, planets in habitable zones are not necessarily in the kind of star we have, but if you have small uh, dwarf stars that are, you know, 10% of our star that that very that orbits uh, like Mercury to our sun would be a habitable zone to those, and there's a great number of those. Right. So actually, there are many, many more stars uh, that are smaller than the sun. And not only that, but those small stars also live almost forever. Yeah, well, not right. forever, but much, much right, longer than right. our sun. Give plenty of time. Uh, yeah. So they have plenty of time to develop things. Yeah. The slightly bad news is that many of those small stars also tend to be more active than the sun. Uh, Namely, they have radiation. these flares and so on. 
which are not so healthy for life. Right. But still, a num good number of them, you know, are fairly quiet. So th they would actually be probably the first targets to try to, you know, wow. uh, characterize wow. these atmospheres. And, yeah. and the first targets because uh, because they have you, a long life. It's uh, well because they are also easier to detect, as you pointed yeah. out. The habitable zone is much closer, yeah, right. so you can find planets, you know, much more easily. Yeah. And also, yeah. they have much less less luminous. So the contrast oh, between the light of yeah. the star and you know the reflected light from yeah. the planet is yeah. is much. And, and the ease is a very easy. important point because if they're closer. It's a habitable zone, but being closer, you can find them quicker because you need multiple exactly rotations. Right. And so exactly. if it's far out, you have to wait Exa 100 years, years yeah. or for right. a far out planet. But if right. it's close, you might be able That's to find right. it in months. So they are much easier to detect and right. uh, there are many more of them. So. So, so if we have billions of planets in the habitable zone in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is one of two trillion galaxies, I mean, the, 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 the probability of life seems just incredibly high, and then you hit directly the Fermi paradox. If all this opportunity and all these planets and, and all the time, we have you know, almost 14 billion years of time, which is plenty of time, yet we don't find anything so far. Well, when we say we don't find anything, we didn't really have the uh, tools to find things, you know, until not that long ago. Mm. So the question is, you know, you more have to ask why didn't they find us and, and things <laughs> of that nature. There are hundreds of possible explanations to the Fermi paradox and I would not even try, you know, to, to give you, you know, but, you know, it's very possible. Well, it's, first of all, it's very possible that in our own Milky Way that life is still relatively rare, so there aren't very many advanced civilizations. But even without that, Imagine that there is a civilization out there, a civilization out there which is very intelligent. By that I mean they are more advanced than us by a billion years. They could think that, you know, we're like microbes for them. So they know about us. They know, we know there are those microbes out there, but, you know, we're not interested in mm -hmm. them at all, nor are we interested in making ourselves known to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are we, what communication do we have with the microbes of our world? Mm -hmm. 